Now let's look at some of the wave's behaviors. Reflection. Reflection happens uh, when a wave reaches the end of a medium and uh, at least part of the energy bounces back. The part that bounces back is the reflection. When a wave reflects off of a fixed end, the hump would switch side. So an upward hump turns into a downward hump. When a reflection goes off a free end, the hump stays uh, the same side. The law of reflection says that the angle of incidence equals to the angle of reflection. Refraction happens when a wave goes from one medium into another medium. Because the speed of a wave de mainly depends on the medium, when a wave goes into a different medium, the speed is going to change. However, its uh, frequency is not going to change. So the frequency is going to stay the same. That means uh, if the wave speed increases, that means uh, the wave length would also increase. The law of refraction says that the sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals to v1 over v2. This means uh, on the faster side, the angle is uh, bigger. The slower side has a smaller angle. Diffraction happens when a wave goes around the obstacle and reach behind the obstacle. That's diffraction. Interference happens when two waves reach the same location at the same time. To figure out what the wave looks like when two waves overlap, we can use the superposition principle and add the displacements together. For example, when these two waves overlap, and we can add the, displacement, the displacements together, usually what I do is I draw the bigger wave, and then I draw that little dip right here, and this would be the results of their interference when they overlap. One special result of interference is uh, standing waves. Let's look at the standing waves on a string. When the string oscillates in one loop, when we have resonance, this is called the fundamental frequency. And then two loops is the fundamental frequency times two, three loops is fundamental frequency times three, and this is also called the first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic. And this part that doesn't have oscillation is the node. The part that has the biggest oscillation is called the anti-node. The length of one loop is always half a wavelength because this is one loop and the one wavelength would go up down and then back. So this would be one wavelength. So one loop is always half a wavelength. We've done this uh, fingering string problem. Let's say we have a string. The fundamental frequency when it oscillates in one loop, that's the main tone we would hear from that string. And if we finger the string one-fifth the way down, we are going to hear a higher tone because the length of a loop gets shorter. The length of the loop used to be L, now it is uh, 4 fifths L. And the speed of a wave equals to frequency times the wavelength. Before and after we finger the string, the speed is the same because it's the same string and under the same tension. So when the length of a loop becomes uh, what, 4 fifths of the previous value, the wavelength changes by the same factor. So the wavelength uh, becomes 4 fifths as well which means that in order to maintain the same speed, the frequency must change to 5 fourths, the original value. So the new frequency we would hear is 5 fourths times the original frequency. And we have done problems like this before. Let's say this string with a weight that's hanging on the other side has this end connected to a vibrating source. So we get the periodic vibration over here, creating a periodic wave coming in. And then the reflected periodic wave and the incoming periodic wave, they would interfere. When the condition is right, when there is resonance, we may see standing waves like this. So let's say now we have three loops oscillating on the string. We can figure out the length of one loop and what happens is that the length of one loop always equals to half a wavelength. And then we have speed equals to frequency times lambda. And the, the speed for a wave on a string is also the square root of the 
tension divided by the mass per unit length. Uh, now, this is the mass is not the same as this hanging mass. This is the mass of the string per unit length. But let's see, maybe I should use a different M over here. Let me use a capital M right there for this box. Okay, the, that means the tension in the string is the capital M, the mass of the box, times G because that's the weight that provides the tension. And then this uh, little m mass per unit length is the mass per unit length for the rope itself. So in this kind of problem, usually we have one of these things that we don't know, and that means uh, we can find it, uh, our unknown if we just know everything else. Uh, 